What do you call someone who hangs around with musicians? A drummer. <laughs> What do you call someone who hangs around with drummers? Deaf. Welcome to today's vlog. Today I am delighted to have the return of Coffee with Dan and today's guest is uh, my great friend and my long-term collaborator, drummer, uh, Derek Skirl. Derek uh, and I have been working together for about eight years now, maybe even longer, and I'm delighted that he's coming along to talk about his career in music and also to talk about some online jazz courses that he's launching. In fact, I think he's launched them already uh, that you can join. They are linked to below and we will talk about those during our coffee with Dan. But we may as well roll the intro. It's been a long time since I've done it, so I hope I've been able to find the intro. Here's the coffee with Dan intro. Welcome, Derek, to Coffee with Dan. I haven't done one of these for a long time. I haven't seen you for a while, actually. I don't think I've actually... Well, no, we, I haven't seen you, actually, since uh, March, since we did a gig at Hot Numbers, I think. Is that right? That was my last gig before lockdown. Mm-hmm. Same here. And we, we had a yeah. sort of rather despairing conversation after the gig, after everyone had sort of socially distanced, wondering when on earth we were going to be back again. So, um, yeah, we, yeah, we are absolutely. back. Um, I mean, have you been out since lockdown? Have you managed, have you been that played anywhere yet? I've had three gigs, um, which were uh, one wedding gig, which looking back, I'm thinking, I'm not entirely sure it was totally <laughs> legit, um, but everyone seemed to keep their distance and, so it felt it felt fine. Um, one was an opera. Well, uh, it was little bits of opera, sort of gala concert, um, which was really nice actually. And the other one was a live stream concert with a recorder player, um, which we did with an audience of three in the room, yeah. and then a live uh, live stream audience of about 150, I think. Oh wow! Uh, so, or I'm, I'm not entirely sure how many people were watching, but it was it was nice to have that mixture actually. For me, it feels a little bit like a recording session. It's about the closest you get to it, but you can't go back and correct your mistakes. You yeah. Can't sort of do a breakdown, you know, it's sort of like you finish and you're like, oh, oh, was that a good take? Well, it doesn't matter because it's now out there and you've got no choice yeah. either way. What What's your earliest musical memory? You know, how far back can you go back and sort of think about when you first started getting music into your life? So, um memory is probably when i was about nine or ten and i have yeah i remember being in a big hall playing the recorder this must have been part of a um a schools concert where lots of schools got together i actually started when when i was five uh playing the piano um because my sister was learning so i thought uh that sounds like fun, I'll do that. Um, and the reason we got into it at all was we had a primary school head teacher who I think noticed that we maybe had a little spark of something musical and essentially forced my parents to go out and buy a piano. Took up percussion when I was about 11. Um, and yeah, and that was that was about it really until I was, I think, 16, and then I got a place at the Junior Royal Academy to do percussion and stayed there for a couple of years. I mean, one of the sort of uh, things I often do on gigs is, you know, kind of sort of review slightly because obviously drummer jokes tend to be focused around, you know, how, you know, how bad the drummer is. I mean, do you have a, a favourite drummer joke? Oh, I, I, I can, but it's definitely not one for broadcast. <laughs> Have you got one to broadcast? Oh, uh, uh, just the one about uh, how, do you, how do you know if the stage is level? 
Oh, the drum, because drill comes out of both sides of the drummer's mouth. Yes, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> how, how did how did a drummer end up uh, studying music at Cambridge? Because that's obviously quite a quite a different thing. It sort of goes against the grain of. It does. Of, of um, sort of uh, general speak. I guess because um, I wasn't a drummer. <laughs> ah, great. Right and, and actually, yeah, drum kit, uh, as as opposed to general percussion and other things, is the yeah, it was one of the last things that I studied properly. Um, so I actually came out of college and realised that my, my drum playing was terrible and played piano in bands for a while until I decided to go and take the drums seriously. Um, so, yeah, very late starter um, as it comes to the drum kit properly. Played, played piano with, a, with, a, with a, um, a certain actor who was in a few films and decided to have a <laughs> put that one in. So what I was have. It playing on top of the pops with Vinnie Jones. It was a little bit surreal. Um, so I got the shout from uh, a friend of mine. Uh, now I was doing um, a touring theatre show somewhere down on the south coast, and then yeah, got a call from from a mate saying, "Are you free for the next fortnight?" Because um, I've got this job that I can't do. So he's looking for a dep, and it was miming keyboards for Vinnie Jones uh, for a, a bunch of uh, TV appearances uh, while he was plugging his album. Um, so I had to pretend to be uh, Jules Holland <laughs> on some of the some of the camera close-ups. What sort of led you on to doing jazz? What, where, where does that interest come from jazz? Because imagine if you've had classical percussion training, how does that weave its way into sort of becoming a jazz drummer in that way? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, my dad was um, kind of glancingly into jazz. Um, I remember he had a tape of Thelonious Monk tunes that was on virtually constant loop in his car um so um and yeah we used to listen to um yeah had a few jazz vinyl records and some sort of light jazz stuff like um lots of disney stuff actually um like jungle book which mm. is actually yeah some some proper jazz musicians in there um so in terms of the the playing I got into it, yeah, like I said, after university, um, putting some little function bands together, I guess, and me being more interested in, I suppose, the the jazz side of things rather than the, the, the disco or rock side. A place at uh, the Royal College, um, and for better or worse, I picked Cambridge. The, the The logical thinking was, if I did the Cambridge course, I could always go and do a performance um, post grad afterwards. Um, now, this relies on you keeping your playing up <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and not falling behind the people who've been to conservatoires, which some people managed. Um, there was a um, and in fact, two very, very good violinists in my year at Selwyn um, who have gone on to performing careers and did postgrads. But they used to get up at half six and do a couple of hours practice before lectures. Um, that was never going to be my route. But on the other hand, Cambridge being what it is, there's a ton of stuff going on. Um, and yeah, I got a, a load of playing in, in lots of different uh, respects, lots of orchestral things. Um, big band playing, really got into, yeah, really got into the big band thing, actually. One, one of the things I, I, you know, I've always liked about your playing and one of the reasons why we, I think we keep working together is that you have got that breadth of musical knowledge that, you know, it's not just all down one particular route of jazz drumming. Um, and I, I've always had this, I remember doing a gig like nearly 20 years ago and I had a guy who was a, a similar to you, was a percussion background and played with uh, my quartet up in Lancashire. And what amazed me was, first of all, how softly he played. 
which is the sax player was 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 quite nice because I wasn't trying to play over the top of the drums. Yeah. But the, the timbre, the colours and sounds that he could get out of a kit that a lot of jazz drummers don't get out of them. You know, they just they mm. just whack the kit. Uh, well, obviously they do more than whack the kit, but it because it was obviously a root like like in sax players, there's this thing where people play a lot of notes and miss out the subtleties of tonal difference. Mm. Um, yeah. And I just kind of wonder, what's it like, kind of as a musician how do you adapt yourself from say playing in a jazz club well let's say how you do you used to adapt yourself <laughs> adapting yourself in the future from say playing in a jazz club one night or playing with a, a brass ensemble in a cathedral or with an orchestra do you have a different approach to how you do it or is it just music and you just kind of find your place within it oh i think more and more the second one it's yeah it's music and you adapt to the context um, yeah, the, the dynamic thing is interesting because I guess having um, a classical background, you're, you're drilled on paying attention to dynamics and listening to the ensemble and the blend between the instruments and adapting your own playing. And yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Lots of drummers um, are very focused on the must sort my time out, which is great. It's an important thing. Um, I don't have the most metronomic time of drummers I know. Um, but if you do that at the expense of everything else, then you, you, like, you might as well put a metronome on. Yeah. Because uh, at least then you can turn down the volume. Yeah. When we're playing, especially in a trio situation, I'm, I'm not often going to you for the time. I'm going to Joel. I'm going to the bass. Yeah. Bass is what's anchoring me in my time. Uh, that's more important to me for for finding where where I am in terms of the time and, and than than the drums are ever ever will be in that sense. It just you know, mm. and when, when we don't have the bass, I miss the bass. How about lockdown? I mean, we, we spoke briefly at the start about what happened in March. How how have you been um, coping? Have you been you know, you're teaching? Have you adapted to online teaching? How are you teaching drums online? It must. I mean, people say that about the saxophone, but I guess it must mm. be more challenging teaching the drums and percussion online? I was very reticent to start with um, because, yeah, lockdown hit and lots of people um, piled in and got online, uh, even if they'd never done it before, um, and sort of <laughs> basically sorted out lots of the issues. And I spent a couple of weeks just essentially biding my time um, and then caught up a little bit later. Um, so I wasn't as late starting as some people, I know some people who've left it almost to this term, actually. Um, I think part of it was I wasn't confident that lots of my students were going to go for it. Um, and actually, I only lost a couple, um, which is surprised me. So most people were willing to give it a go. Um, and I've enjoyed it far more than I thought I would. And you're actually now moving on. Uh, you, you, you've, you've just have you launched it yet, or you are launching it? These online, you've you decided to do some online jazz courses on improvisation and things. Yeah. So we we've, we've had two sessions. Um, one one was just a meet and greet, so that everyone could get to know each other and and we could have a discussion about. Uh, I guess what people wanted out of the course, what their expectations are, what their musical journeys are, which I think is really important. And last night was the first proper session. This course was meant to happen at Stapleford Granary, which um, you and I played at quite a bit, uh, which is and recorded at, uh, which is yeah. a lovely venue. Um, and so it, it, they run they run a bunch of different courses, quite a few musical ones, um, as mainly as evening classes. So in person, these were going to be um, four sessions over the term of two hours each, which is nice because, yeah, get together, make a bit of noise. Um, I thought, right, if we're going to do this online, let's skinny it down a bit because two hours mm. at a stretch is a lot. Um, so I've decided to do it one hour a week uh, over 10 weeks. So actually, it's a slightly longer course. So, Derek, that sounds absolutely great. So how can people sign up uh, for this online course? I presume even though you started last night, people can still join it, um, watching it now. Absolutely, yeah. Um, they can get in touch with me via my Facebook page. Which is? Uh, which is right? Derek Skull Drums and Percussion. Right, I'll link to it below anyway. So it will be in the comments section below, so they can do that. Thanks. 
and uh, and and, and going to that. And I, I've got to say, I highly, highly recommend Derek as a teacher. He was teaching my son Charlie piano for a while. Uh, Charlie's moved to trumpet now, so that's a whole other oh. thing <laughs> of me on that. But um, but yeah, definitely uh, a sign up for that. And uh, what what are you hoping? Uh, what do you, what how do you see things moving the next six to twelve months for us as as live musicians? I mean, we've got a gig coming up in November. Uh, socially distanced at Saffron Hall. I mean, how, how do you see things panning out? I think there's going to be a fair bit of, like you say, the, the social distance thing, larger venues, but with not very many people in, um, which is tough because the venues aren't going to make um, the the money that they were making before. Um, there's probably going to be lots. I've seen this happen a few times of shorter concerts that get repeated two or three times in an evening so you can get a few audiences through. Um, obviously outdoor, wherever possible. Um, trying to think if I've got some more. Uh, I've got an outdoor jam session coming up. <laughs> so we're all praying for nice weather. I think you're going to find venues innovating. Um, you've, you've seen lots of places uh, putting up big marquees in the gardens things like that um, this opera thing that i did um, which was bank holiday um, in august uh, we had an enormous marquee with i think 10 people in it so we're all spread apart uh, and then it was like a like a drive-in really so people came parked their cars at various spots and had picnics next to them yeah it's a slightly yeah, it's new good. world isn't it it is, but I guess you know we, we've we've got one of the things that gives me hope is that as musicians, particularly as jazz musicians, we're always having to innovate, always having to think about new ways of doing things, and we, we you know we're actually pretty we should be pretty creative people. So there's always uh, ways to come out about it. Derek, it's really good to see you. Cheers for Likewise. the I, I hope people will come in and sign up on the course below and go, and go at least like your Facebook page anyway. Oh yeah, uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting back out playing with you on the 13th of November. Take care, Bye for now. <laughs>
are a series of recordings I did with Derek about 18 months ago in my old studio. You can access them on my Patreon page for just $2 a month. In fact, you can just pay $2, watch those and leave if you really need to. I wouldn't be very happy about it, but you could do. Uh, but you, know, you can go and check those out. There's also some more duos with Dan over on my Patreon page and loads and loads of other things. You can get the link just below as you can to Derek's Facebook page. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for Derek uh, for doing this coffee with Dan. We are slowly getting back to normal. We've done coffees with Dan and the vlogs are coming back and yeah, it's slowly coming back. I'm really looking forward to that gig on the 13th of November. Thank you for watching, as I've said already. Make sure you click a like and a subscribe if you don't already. And I'll see you really soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.